It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. We are up north, as you might be able to notice. I'll get to that in just a little bit, but if you have any updates to the prayer concerns, please let me know by using the contact information on the screen. And please also remember we're continuing to have two worship services every Lord's Day, so make sure to sign up online. If you need any help signing up online, please talk to either me or to Kenna. Uh, once again, I have a special request for those of you who are joining us by listening in on the phone tonight. I would I'd like to have a series of lessons based on requests from those of you who join us in our phone audience. And so if you are not watching online, but you are listening, having called in on the phone, I would invite you to be thinking of what you would like to hear in sermon form, any questions about the Bible, a favorite Bible passage that we haven't studied for a while, maybe a topic uh, that we need to study, or a favorite Bible character. So if you could get in touch, I would appreciate that. My number is 608-224-0274. We'll have the other contact information on the screen in just a little bit. You may be able to notice that I am standing by Lake Superior. This is actually sunrise on Monday morning. I hope it's not too loud. I'll have to listen to it and redo it if it is a little bit later, but Lake Superior is my favorite lake. Uh, it is the largest of the Great Lakes, the largest body of fresh water on the face of this earth based on surface area. Uh, roughly 160 miles wide, about 350 miles long. Uh, the shoreline measures just over 2,700 miles. The deepest point is 1,300 feet. 10% uh, of all the Earth's fresh water is found right here in this lake. That's enough volume to cover all of North and South America to a depth of 12 inches if we were to spread out the water in Lake Superior. Extreme water clarity lets you see uh, for quite a ways, up to 100 feet underwater, which is absolutely amazing. I once went swimming right near here, and I am pretty sure when I opened my eyes underwater, I could see Canada all the way over. Just you could see the the uh, sand dropping away, and just uh, just an awesome view underwater. Of course, I could not feel my extremities, couldn't feel my hands and my feet. Uh, the average water temperature is only around 55 degrees this time of year. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and we won't be relying on it too much tonight, but in our class I will occasionally refer to a harmony of the Gospels. So we'll be looking at Luke tonight, not so much in the harmony, but this is by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry. You can get that online. By way of review, we know that Luke was a Gentile. He was a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He includes a lot of people and groups that are often excluded or oppressed in the ancient world, so women, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans, as well as a number of sick. Last week we looked at the first half of Luke 12 where we had some warnings about hypocrisy followed by some of the warning uh, signs for the sins of greed. You may remember a guy comes to Jesus to tell his brother to give him part of the estate, but instead of stepping into that mess, instead of arbitrating, this dispute, Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool. That was the man who decided to tear down his barns and build bigger barns to hold all of his crops, but he died that night. He should have been rich toward God. He should have included God in his plans. We then had the illustration of the lilies. We're not to worry about what to eat or what to wear because God cares not only for the birds and the lilies, but he also cares for us. And tonight we pick up with the rest of Luke chapter 12, and we're about to find that the danger shifts uh, the, uh, the conversation shifts from the danger of greed to the importance of being ready. And that's the second half of Luke chapter 12. So we're going to start tonight with Luke 12 verses 35 through 40. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And so again, the first half of this chapter is about greed, and it seems from the second half of this chapter it is about being ready. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit, Jesus says. Some of you know that I have a thing for flashlights. You can never have too many flashlights. Uh, on the keychain, on my phone case, in the car, by the front door, in the bed, or not in the bed, <laughs> but by the bed, 
uh, in my office, by the breaker box in the basement, in the garage, at the church building, in my camping gear, headlights, rechargeables, AAA, AA, lasers to point at the stars, I guess that counts as a light, uh, red lights for not messing up your night vision, uh, weapon mounted lights, and just on and on and on. Uh, last week I found a searchlight to go with my Milwaukee Tool M18 series, and that's what's uh, lighting us right here on the beach. It has 1200 lumens and will run for six hours. Uh, I might have imagined it, but the first time I, I turned it on, I, I, thought it, I thought there might have been a little kickback. You can almost feel it, you know, such a, such a strong light. But when Jesus is talking about being ready and keeping our lamps lit, we need to think about what they did for light back then. They had handheld oil lamps that ran on olive oil and had a wick. But remember, they didn't have matches either, and so to light a lamp would have been a real hassle, wouldn't it have? especially in the dark. I'm assuming they would either go to a fire that was already started or, you know, started in that way, or they might need to rub sticks together or something like that. And I'm just imagining hearing a bump in the night and needing to rub sticks together for five or ten minutes or so before seeing what it is that's out there. And so when Jesus talks about keeping your lamps lit, he's referring to always being ready. He clarifies in verse 36, he tells his disciples to be like men who are waiting for their master return to return from a wedding feast. They don't know exactly when that return will be, but they know it will be fairly soon, within hours. Not weeks, not months, not years. If it were months or years, it wouldn't make sense to keep the lamps burning. But as it is, the master of the house is expected at any moment. And the expectation is when he returns, the servants need to be ready to open that door immediately and to welcome him in. In verse 37, there is a blessing on those who are on the alert when the master comes back. And what I find interesting is what happens next when the master returns. Notice that the master will gird himself up to serve and will have his slaves recline at the table and he will wait on them. That's probably not what we expected to happen here. The slaves need to be on the alert, and those who are on the alert when he returns, they are the ones who get served instead of the other way around, as we might expect. So what comes to mind when we think about a master serving his own servants? Think about what's coming in a few months here, the time when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. To me, anyway, I see some foreshadowing here. Maybe you do as well. Those servants who are ready will be served by their own master. In fact, Jesus even says that the master will gird himself to serve. Remember on the night before he died, Jesus girded himself with a towel in order to wash the disciples' feet. Getting back to the parable, we find in verse 38 that the master might return at any time. He's definitely coming back, we just don't know when. The second and a third watch would refer to the periods of time in the middle of the night and in the early hours of the morning. And there's a blessing on those slaves who are still alert and ready at the time of his return, whenever that might be. In verses 39 and 40, the picture shifts just a little bit, and Jesus now starts talking about thieves breaking into a house. And the Lord explains that if the head of the house had known when the thief was coming, he would have been ready. He would not have allowed his house to be broken into. And the point he makes is, since we don't know when the Son of Man will return, we, therefore, need to be ready at all times. We need to always be ready for his return. Some of you know that we had a bit of a uh, close call, I guess you might say, at our house a week and a half ago. Like a lot of places in Dane County lately, we've had a rash of young people driving around in what are probably stolen cars, and they will jump out and test door handles on cars in driveways. And if they get in, they will take anything of value, money, electronics, guns, whatever they can find. And they will often use the garage door opener, if they can, to open the garage, to go into the house, to steal things from the house, and to sometimes get the keys to the car from somewhere right inside the door. Many people hang their keys right inside the door, and then they'll go back out and they'll steal the car, and then they'll swap cars and keep on moving. Last Monday morning, I think it was, I was downstairs making coffee, and at 4.43 a.m., our dog started going nuts. And I looked outside, I saw taillights leaving, and then I heard a neighbor's car alarm going off. And so I went outside, didn't see anything, so I checked the security camera on my phone, and this is what I saw. That young man had just checked our car doors. Thankfully, everything was locked, they didn't get in. I called the police, they got there very quickly. 
unfortunately did not find these people. Uh, but here's the point. If I had known that people would try breaking into our cars at 4.43 a.m. last Monday morning, I might have prepared just a little bit better. I might have moved the cars. I could have waited out there, I guess, for them. Probably not a wise move. But it could have been interesting. We could have set a trap, could have put super glue under the door handles, you know, all that kind of thing. We could have had the police waiting right there, probably the wise choice. But as it is, probably the smartest thing to do is what we did. We locked the car doors. We were about as prepared as we could have been. And that's what Jesus is saying here. We need to be as ready for his return as we would be for a thief in the night. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. And that is the main point of this passage. Notice the lesson continues in the next paragraph. So let's move forward to Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. Luke 12, 41 through 48. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required and to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask all the more. And so as Peter listens, he seems to understand what the Lord is saying here, but he's wondering, is this really about us or is this about everybody? Exactly who are the servants in this story? Remember, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, but he's surrounded by a huge crowd of people, so many thousands that people are stepping on each other. And so Peter wants some clarification, exactly to whom are you speaking here? And in response, it seems that Jesus identifies the apostles as those who are in charge of the other servants, doesn't he? At least that's the way I read this. Jesus actually answers Peter's question with a question, but it seems that he's looking for faithful and sensible stewards to put in charge here, and it seems that this would be a reference to the twelve. On the other hand, if a servant takes advantage of the master's absence and uses that time to slack off, if a servant uses that unsupervised time to abuse the other slaves and to eat and drink and get drunk, that slave will be caught off guard by the master's return, and he'll be cut in pieces and kicked out, assigned a place with the unbelievers. At the end, we have a brief discussion that seems to address varying degrees of punishment in the life to come. In this life, we realize that some crimes and some circumstances call for either more or less severe punishment. A judge or jury might take into account what somebody knows at the time, what their mental capacity is, the severity of the crime, and so on. And they will obviously adjust the punishment accordingly. And the same is true here. A slave who clearly knows what his master expects and refuses to get ready, he will receive many lashes. But a slave who does not know what the master expects and commits deeds worthy of a flogging, this second slave will receive fewer lashes than the first. Obviously, we wonder what this means, and it seems to me that there must be varying degrees of punishment in the life that's coming after this one. Exactly what does that mean? I don't know. Either this is literal, in other words, hell will hurt more for some people than for others, or this is figurative in some way. Some people will suffer more than others, perhaps emotionally. Maybe because they came so close to being saved, they knew better, but they refused to repent as opposed to never really understanding what sin is. Or maybe some combination of these. If we were together, I wish we could discuss this a little better, but these seem to be at least two of the leading theories out there. Clearly, though, Jesus explains that there will be some difference in the punishment uh, different people receive based on their level of knowledge and their level of understanding. To answer the so what question, we should probably ask ourselves, how much knowledge do we have? Those of you listening to this message, and the answer is that those of us watching or listening to this class, we are probably more knowledgeable about what we need to be doing than just about anybody else in this world. I think you might agree with me there. In other words, we are the ones who know what the Master's will is. Therefore, we, of all people, 
if we choose to disobey, we will probably be held more accountable than most. And that's how this passage applies to us. We need to obey what we know. And those of us in this class that I probably know more than most concerning God's plan for our lives. The last one line applies to us as well as those who have been given much. Much will be required. We've heard the gospel. Most of us listening tonight have obeyed it. Many of us in this class tonight have even taught the gospel to others at some point. Much has been entrusted to us. Therefore, much will be asked of us. Much will be required of us. Uh, we are not the ones who can claim ignorance of God's law. Uh, speaking of punishment, speaking of fire, let's notice Jesus continues, and this goes into Luke chapter 12, verses 49 through 53. Luke 12, 49 through 53. Jesus says this, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So obviously one reason for Jesus coming to earth was to cast fire on the earth, according to this passage. Since the earth was not literally burned up back then, this is, is apparently figurative. If we were together, I might ask, in what sense might this fire be figurative? And I think most of us understand that fire has a way of purifying, doesn't it? Fire has a way of burning off the impurities and leaving behind what is true. And in this sense, Jesus came to this earth to start separating the wheat from the chaff, we might say. But before this cleansing or purification begins, Jesus says that he has a baptism to undergo. Remember, Jesus has already been baptized in a literal sense, buried underwater briefly by John the Baptist, and so this one seems to be figurative. In some way, Jesus will be immersed in a way that is causing him distress. And this seems to be a reference to the crucifixion, which is now only nine months away at this point. By the way, if some of you are new to using the Harmony of the Gospels, you can go to the index in the back and find the passage that you're reading, make a note of the section number, and then look for that section number in the timeline at the very end of the book. And in that way, we can get an approximate date for the passage that we're reading and fit it into the chronology. But back in verse 50, we might not realize that Jesus was truly distressed over what was about to happen. The apostles, they don't really seem to get it at this point, but Jesus seems to be able to see it coming in some way. He knows what is about to happen. He then gives what can be seen as a contradiction. He came not to bring peace on the earth, but rather division. Of course, there is a sense in which Jesus brings peace. He brings peace between God and humanity. He brings peace between Jews and Gentiles. But in another sense, Jesus brings division, doesn't he? And he explains it. Families will be divided, religiously divided. Some will follow Jesus, many will not. And this brings division. We might see arguments about what to do for fun in the family. We might see arguments about giving to the poor and how much to do. We might see arguments about how to raise our children, how to train them up and bring them up in the Lord. We might see arguments about how we spend our free time, and it's really important that we as Christians do not allow ourselves to get dragged along into sin like this. This is the warning about being unequally yoked together to unbelievers. Some have applied this passage to marriage over in uh, what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and it might apply to marriage if we're the ones getting dragged along into sin by a spouse instead of us dragging a spouse to the Lord, so to speak. But the passage applies to all of us. In this uh, conflict Jesus brings into the world, uh, we are not to allow ourselves to get pulled into sin. And that decision to always do the right thing uh, will obviously bring conflict into the most intimate of relationships if we're not careful. We now come to the last paragraph in Luke chapter 12. So let's turn over to uh, the last section here, Luke chapter 12, verses 54 through 59. Luke 12, 54 through 59. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, 
on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officers throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. Once again, Jesus takes something very common and he uses it to teach a profound spiritual lesson, even something as simple as predicting the weather. He takes what everybody knows and he uses it to teach something spiritual. Everybody knows when you see a cloud in the west, it's about to rain. Everybody knows when the wind comes from the south, it's about to be a hot day, especially in Israel. And yet, even though this is true, these people are apparently unable to analyze what's going on all around them, spiritually speaking. Not only that, but they can't even determine right from wrong. They are unable to judge what is right. They can judge the weather, but not their own moral behavior. And speaking of judging, Jesus then illustrates this by suggesting that if they're on their way to court getting sued for something, it's wise to try to settle out of court. Otherwise, if they lose, they get thrown into prison, basically forever, because they're obviously unable to pay back a debt from prison. As I look back over this paragraph, I'm kind of wondering what all of this, uh, whether this is really about Jesus facing his own crucifixion. Uh, those who are spiritually aware should have been able to see it coming. They should have seen it. They should. He said a few things already up to this point, but even his own disciples pretty much seem oblivious, don't they? They don't, they don't seem to understand. And Israel itself, instead of plunging forward into destruction, they should be working things out with the judge, so to speak, in this last little illustration. They should be making peace with Jesus now before it's too late. But unfortunately, most do not. And the nation pays a heavy price in AD 70 when Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. That brings us now tonight to the end of Luke chapter 12. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests so I can get those in the bulletin. And remember, if you're joining us on the phone, I would love to hear your sermon request. What do we need to be studying in sermon form? Uh, drop something in the mail or feel free to give me a call at 608-224-0274. Next week, uh, let's all come prepared by reading Luke chapter 13. Just checking. Looks like the sun is still coming up, so we're good. Let's go to God in prayer as we close. Our Father in heaven, you are the almighty and everlasting God. You are the great God who has told us to prepare for a life after this one. Tonight we pray that we might always be prepared, that we might always be ready. We pray that we might encourage each other as this day comes closer. We know that your Son has brought us peace, but we also know that our faithfulness to his word will bring division into this world and into our lives. We pray that we might be the ones who influence others, not the other way around. We don't want to be influenced by the world, getting pulled out of the straight and narrow path into lives of sin and rebellion against you. Keep us, keep us faithful. We're thankful for Luke and for his written account of your son's life on this earth. We're thankful for Jesus and for the words that he spoke while he was here. We pray that we would always be faithful to our confession that your son is the Messiah. We come to you with these requests, both thanking and praising you in the name of Jesus, your son our Lord and our Savior. Amen.